entrepreneurs, uh, often pressure to kind of present a uh, rosy kind of picture of success, some, something they have to do to kind of present their business. Um, but we want to either challenge that or kind of look behind it and talk about a little bit more candidly, uh, a little bit more humanly about the things that go so well, some of the challenges um, that entrepreneurs face, um, and the lessons I've learned from them. We definitely don't want this to be a negative event, uh, like, you know, or all about failure. Really, the idea is to speak openly um, about you know, things that haven't gone well. I'm really, really grateful for the speakers who are willing to kind of open up about that. But then also to speak about um, what, what opportunities that's given and what, what entrepreneurs have learned from those, um, those challenges. Um, but also, I mean, mistakes are inevitable in all walks of life, including entrepreneurship. And I think it's really valuable to just remind ourselves of that. Um, and so we have three speakers tonight. The uh, format will be each speaker will speak for roughly 15, 20 minutes, something like that, and then there'll be opportunity to ask questions um, after each speaker. Um, help yourself to wine, fruit juice, and I should say this door is also open, so especially at the end, if you want to pop your head out, it's really nice out there. Um, you do have to keep the door a bit of foot, but here you go. Cool, well without further ado, let me introduce um, Julio Alejandro, if I pronounce your name correctly. So Julio is uh, an entrepreneur, consultant, um, a journalist, um, speaker, and operating uh, in the realm of blockchain and other decentralized um, technologies. Um, he's a real expert there. He's uh, founded multiple companies, some of which haven't gone entirely to plan um, by his own admission, and he's going to um, speak to us about that. Um, but it's great to have somebody speaking not only to our theme tonight, but, but speaking on something that is really in vogue right now. Even if a few of us don't exactly understand blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies and whatnot, but it's a huge thing right now. Um, so it's great to welcome Huda. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm really, really, really pleased to be in this university. I've been speaking. I've been, as, uh, as Sam mentioned before, I have like a, like a very, very distinctive background of how people come into the field of entrepreneurship. I come more from the public sector. Uh, myself, I was a journalist you know, working in Chicago and in Mexico, and I was always concerned only about politics, only about redistribution, only about like social justice and kind of like a very hardcore left. Uh, activists within immigration rights, uh, Black Lives Matter, feminist movements in the States. And I come from like that kind of background, being raised by two parents, uh, come from like a journalistic side. And now I get like a radical shift. Over the last three years, I decided that politics was not gonna be for me. That I didn't want to be more uh, uh, within the redistribution side of it, but I wanted to create a business. Uh, but having no background in business, failing finance a number of times in university, and having absolutely no knowledge or capacity to use basic technological products, I ended up, uh, I ended up working in fintech, uh, not only in blockchain itself, but in financial, in financial technologies. And if I would have to go back uh, just five or six years ago, uh, no one of my friends, none of my families, uh, none everyone within my circle would imagine that I could have given this radical step from political journalism in the south of Chicago, a very segregated area, moving into financial technologies, into a different continent, into a different language, into a different system of beliefs. So I'll be talking tonight about three things that I think uh, that every entrepreneur should have, and three things that I see that entrepreneurs usually fail at doing. We don't really do it that well, and I think that if we would pay more time and attention and do those things, we would be a little bit more I'm not sure if successful, but uh, we would be at least happier and with a better heart. <laughs> so first is what happens whenever you transition from, uh, from, your back, from your career into a different industry? What happens when they don't have like, a lot of similar skills? When public speaking and, and, being, and, and speaking towards a microphone or having a camera and, and writing speeches, they don't really help you with financial accountability and financial cost. How do you learn about what is blockchain and what is decentralization? Uh, what is cryptocurrencies? What is investment? What is a VC capital? What is, a, what is an angel? When you don't really have anything in common in here, most of the skills that you would find somewhere in between are virtually inexistent. So the first thing that happened to me is that I had to learn how to unlearn, right? So from, from being a journalist and from being a political journalist, you usually try to shut down someone else in an argument. If you've seen any of the Fox News or CNN or any of the politicians fighting within themselves, they don't let themselves speak. And that's what I used to do just until very few years ago. In any conversation that I used to have, 
I used to prove that I had a point, that I had the information, the facts, the good uh, reasoning of that information. And I also th thought that I should always be in charge of whatever conversation. That led to massive problems me having it in, in the United Kingdom, where most of the population, most of the people, they tried to be more respectful, a little bit more quiet, a little bit more uh, compliant or understanding, and they tend not to fight so much with each other. So the first thing that I needed to learn how, was how to unlearn and how to eliminate the negative traits or the positive traits that existed in one city, in one profession, but they eliminate it, and they're not being successful. They're actually a burden. So the thing that I learned for five years, I had to renew them, I had to stop them, I had to mutilate them in order for me to try to be a better person or to try to be a better interpreter. Other thing that I learned is how do you become um, different inside of a, a, an atmosphere that is so multicultural and diverse? Meaning, should you try to blend in into kind of like the mainstream? And that created massive problems within me saying, I don't understand finance, I don't understand technology, I only know how to write articles and how to interview people over the microphone. How do I change that idea? And I was scared as hell, I was almost crying. Like I used to go with meetings to, to entrepreneurials and I didn't know what was a full stack. I doubted and I almost cried when someone told me that I was gonna understand a C. I asked him to explain like if it's a B or a B, like in Spanish. <laughs> Uh, are you venture capitalist? And why not venture capital? And what's why an angel? Does he fly? Does he does he have wings? Is he a supernatural entity? Like, are, are, is he a priest? Is he a religious person? What do you mean by an angel? And why do angel invest? So I didn't understand the value of being radically different within an atmosphere that is so homogeneous within the financial and the technological side, where most or everyone wears the same suits, goes nine to five, tend to have the same interests in watches and champagne and whiskey and in high-end clubs. How did you stand out and how do you differentiate in that area? So that was the first thing that led me to, 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 to create my first startup that is called Humanitarian Blockchain. And it was an idea that I couldn't even put on paper. And I couldn't even have a business plan, a sketch model, let alone to have any media publicity or anything along those lines. So I did what I did best. Uh, I went to university, uh, London School of Economics, with a couple of friends, with my girlfriend actually, and I told them I would like to give a talk. A talk about what? Well, about how does human rights correlate with technology? So I found a niche that technology people do not know how to communicate and, and FinTech does not care that much about human rights. And I created an organization that involved what the FinTech largely lacks, which is human rights, feminism, Black Lives Matter, immigrant rights, and that kind of like leftist thing. Put it into those ideas. For over a year, the only thing that we accomplished was media publications, about 20 of them uh, within a year, and um, me giving a lot of talks. I can speak forever in public for, you know, for any, on virtually any kind of topic of something. So I ended up going to the United Nations, to European uh, Union, to University of Cambridge, to the London School of Economics, but we, I didn't even have a specific product itself. I didn't even have something specific to sell or to portray uh, to someone. And in most of the meetings that I used to go to, they asked me, okay, so what exactly do you need? Why and how? And I literally broke, took my pen and this kind of notebooks that I have everywhere, and I just started writing and writing and writing and telling, I need $20,000 because this is how much the price cost of a ticket. This is the five projects that we have the refugees that involves 15 Bitcoin Visa debit cards. This is the price of five developers using Solidity and JavaScript uh, to build smart contracts uh, to create a decentralized autonomous organization. And I need, and my personal cost is $5,000. Within this very ridiculous, ignorant, childish, immature, and you know, I could just be a politician by having all these characteristics. Uh, with all of this immaturity, that's how I created my first start without even understanding what would be the audience that I had to do to deliver, without understanding what is the specific product that I had to give. It took me four months 
getting together with businessmen and entrepreneurs, asking them, what is a business campus model? It took me almost two days to just to finish one, and I almost cried. I was almost virtually in tears saying, I cannot understand or explain what is a business canvas model. Like it's, too, it's too difficult for me. I'm not capable of doing this. It's, it's the learning curve, the learning skills of arriving here, it's way too complicated. Like whenever you first start coding and they ask you to do basic, um, how to write a calculator, which is like the easiest thing on, uh, on Python, and you have absolutely no clue, and, and you just keep going and going and going and going over the variables, and you just fail and fail and fail and say, like, this is so quick. Like, how can someone build Facebook or a video game, and I cannot build a simple algorithmic mathematical explanation over the easiest language to code, or the first language to code, which is Python? How can you do that? It was the exact same mindset that I had. I cannot do this. I cannot go forward. So one of the recommendations and one of the things that I see with people is that they overthink the problems too much without taking action. Especially people that are very successful in college or very successful in a high like, precision job, like you're a surgeon or you study to be a journalist, and you need to have the facts 100% right. If you fail and you say that Hillary Clinton received one million and you point and you, and you write 15 million or 16 million, you just add up one digit, you can't get sued, your reputation goes to hell, and you cannot move forward. That kind of skill set of having perfectionism in entrepreneur, it's arguably the biggest problem that we have. We cannot maintain having perfection and having a very skilled team, very entrepreneurial mindset, if we want to accomplish quick things that are going to be broken within very few minutes or very few days and that are going to be needed to change because the customer, the client, the end people that is on the other side of the road, he's going to need to change that within very few days. Another problem that I see with, uh, with, with people that go into entrepreneurship is that they lack, they they're kind of a general, they're between a generalist and a hyper specialist. And they don't necessarily define themselves with a very cute, quick and immediate atmosphere. People that are so good at doing plenty of things, they can do fintech and they can do journalism and they can do entrepreneurship and they can do so many things. They usually end up just saying, well, I'm, I'm such a great person. I have, uh, I have experience within all of these industries and all these ecosystems and I can build so many products that I cannot define myself within a curriculum or within three words. Meaning, the simple elevator pitch that people do, and that you should remember, and that you should have like way up front, direct and visible for anyone to understand it. Kind of an on and off button. Like, people ask you something, you're supposed to repeat this, regardless of the question, regardless of the answer, regardless of anything. People don't have those ideas so quick. I ask people to define themselves within three words individually and professionally. If you don't know what are those three words, if you say, I'm a blockchain expert, what the hell does that mean? Like, do you build ICOs? Or do you do investing in cryptocurrencies? Are you a technical developer of uh, Solidity? Are you, uh, do you build smart cities within urbanism? What do you do whenever you say that you do blockchain? That, that, that comes up a, a lot of you. And people ask me those kind of things as well. I, you need to say, you do, I do strategy, communication, and sales. Anything outside of this, it's a premium. I'm gonna charge you more. I might not be prepared for that. I might recommend you going somewhere else. I will uh, redirect you to another industry. You need to have those three ideas instead of being a generalist, being a hyper specialist. And this leads me to another topic that I wanna mention, and it would be the last one. Many people that are within here in Queen, uh, Queen Mary University of London, many of them you sh should be probably from 20, 25 years old. Should you go directly into entrepreneurship, into a startup? Those ideas of being an innovator, a, a businessman, being in charge of your own time, in charge of your energy, being your own boss, claiming back your sovereignty, should you go within those ideas or should you wait a little bit more until you already have some experience?
arguably poor bird experience. So as much as it breaks my heart to tell you this, but I would recommend you not to follow your dreams if you're 21 years old. You don't have enough knowledge, you don't have enough, enough experience, and you're not mature with your, it's yourself, yourself to become an entrepreneur. Many people do that, but those are the 1%. Nine out of 10 digital startups, including in blockchain and including in ICOs and cryptocurrencies, the hottest and most arguably the most profitable sector that exists now in London. FinTech, artificial intelligence, internet of things, smart cities and FinTech. Within those very, very entrepreneurial, very money driven, that you see every day in the newspapers and every day in Eventbrite and meetups, everyone is talking about artificial intelligence with additive manufacturing, create an ICO and raising $500 million in 24 hours. Should you go into those kind of extremes? And they show you the face of a 21 year old or a 25 year old guy doing that. That is scarce. That is media wise what media portrays. That is what we want to think about some Jesus Christ, some Imam Hussein, some Buddha, Ya Ali, Ya Hassan that think that they can do that. But the overwhelming times are those stories that are not heard of entrepreneurs that fail when they're 25, fail again when they're 28, fail again when they're 31, but by the time that they're 35, nobody remembers them. And now they have to go back to from scratch to go into do a corporate job that is nine to five that would teach them the discipline, the idea of having a boss, an authority, and having a stable structure that states the th steps that you have to take to be successful. We think that we can eliminate all those processes in millennials. We think that the world doesn't deserve us. We think that we're just too good to be true. We think that we have too many followers, that we're just too cute, that we're, it's only about taking digital uh, selfies and putting them out there and people are gonna love us and they're gonna care about our uh, intentions. My one of the recommendations I would have is if you don't have significant failures and significant experience in failing for three, probably five years, do not become an entrepreneur because your story will be the one that is not being heard and has never and will never be heard because it's being shadows by those Facebook and Instagram young developers that they started in Harvard School they left university and they did their own thing. I see many people failing with those ideas. So uh, again, thank you very much. My name is Julio Alejandro. I work in blockchain and journalism, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julio. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but first, does anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Um, how were you when you uh, created your company? 27. 27. Yeah. And how long did it take you basically to like create your company to launch it? So from the idea to the formation, it took me about six months. In average, it should take you about one week or one month. Because I literally have, didn't have the slightest idea what to do. It took me so long. I was scared, scared, and I didn't trust myself. Now I think that I trust myself too much, which is equally wrong. Um, I haven't heard much about this company, uh, Blockchain. Uh, what do you specifically do? You do is it platform for trading? Yeah. So, so what, what um, kind of assets do you trade? So Blockchain is like a new internet. It's not a company, it's a technology. It's not owned by one person. It's like the internet that is decentralized and everybody owns it. Like emails or social media, everybody owns it. Uh, think about it as if we would be talking about the internet 20 or 30 years ago, and someone would ask you to define what is the internet. So it's emails, so what's an email? It's social media, it's social media. It's a browser, where you, you can put like, what's a browser, what's Google, what's Facebook, what's... So the blockchain, it's a process, and it's an ecosystem where you do research and development, aiming that within two to five years, you will create a platform similar and as powerful as Facebook or Google. You 
mention going into like corporate out of university or to be a bit more mature, stuff like that. How long would you say you should work in corporate to build? I know it's very specific depending on how fast you mature, but what would you recommend? If you already have an MBA and you're 23, I think that you should spend three to five years. Meaning the most corporate, the more structured that is your, your, your life and your knowledge and your capacity to fail, the more resilient that you would be towards creating and eliminating plans within the very volatile startup world. So if you're 21, wait, or if you're 18, if you're 18, nobody cares about you. Or if you're 21, nobody cares about you either way. But uh, let's say once you graduate, at least wait two to five years. The average of having an MBA in Northwestern University, for example, is 26 years old. Meaning, wait a little bit longer. Talk a lot about experiencing failure, um, but also suggest going the corporate route three to five years. Would you arguably the corporate route is quite a safe environment, right? Would you recommend not recommend going and working for other people's startups to get a higher failure rate and more experience of failure rather than going into the corporate world and arguably being in a, a much sort of lower environment? The failure rate is what you're looking for. Failure rate, but structure stability, I think, are the two keys. So uh, a company like WeWork, which is like a sharing space, it's a startup. Spotify, it, it runs like a startup. People could argue that Google, even if it's, it's tremendously a transnational corporation, kind of runs like a startup. Uh, so the problem is not the amount of people that you have, but who is going to teach you whenever you cannot physically deliver something and you're trying by yourself. Uh, and you don't have anybody else to ask for. That is that is the biggest question. Like, how do you breach the gap of knowing the most that you can and having a routine, a proven, tested routine over the, over the time that it's the result of a tradition, a company having a tradition and traditionally doing the same product for over 50 years or 60 years, and they understand what works and what doesn't work. What are the biggest problems and how to solve them the quickest and the easiest way? Once you have those structures, you can you can replicate them into your startup. If you don't have those structures, like me, it's going to take you six months to create a company that should have taken you one week. So that information, if you don't have it beforehand, and if you don't know that you're supposed to do step one, step two, step three, step four, you will have to learn it yourself. And something that will take you one month, very likely will take you up to a year for you to learn it yourself. Yeah, so you mentioned that it's better to get into the corporate world first before doing your own startup. So my question is, what is your comment on the kind of security, both in financial and social sense, that a corporate job would give you? So it's really, so most people would go into a corporate job and think that, okay, we'll work this for a few years being experienced, but a lot of them also let their dreams die because of that, because it feels so stable and so secure, both in terms of financial sense, that what if I leave this and start my own company, and right now I'm making more than 100 grand a year, to leave this completely and start something out from scratch, that is quite a huge jump and a huge difference. So what is your comment on that? That's beautiful, but the, the profile that you're mentioning is someone that is 50 years old, mm -hmm. meaning he has 25 years working in Cisco and he just entered WeWork, or he just created his, his own entrepreneurial bank mindset. He knows the ecosystem, he knows the system, he has the context, he has experience, he has a lot of what we call in Spanish colmillo, like very, very, very strong uh, endurance and experience in how to deal with clients, why do clients complain. And I think it's a wonderful idea. Over the last talks that I gave, I'm talking to an audience that should be under 30 years old, most of them. Probably 25, 28. I don't know. Uh, if I would, within the other ones that I give within the European Parliament or in the European Commission, I tell everyone to abandon their positions and go into entrepreneurship. I'm talking to politicians or I'm talking to businessmen that are 40, 60, 70 years old. It's a great idea to be an entrepreneur. You already have the knowledge, have the experience, but there's a backlog, a 
quasi-biological factor that the same way that you remember how you were 15 years old and you were kind of like childish and immature, and you look back and say like, oh my God, how, how could I be so ignorant like when I was 15 years old? When entrepreneurs or when businessmen see people that go into entrepreneurship that are 21 years old, they see the same thing. And once or maybe if you're 26 or 30 years old, you're gonna look back whenever you were 21 and thought that you could eat the whole world and that you were having such successful uh, experiences in your career, in literally like university roles, probably you did an internship in McKinsey, uh, but at the end of the day, those experiences will not necessarily translate to something else. They die and they disappear and people don't talk about it. It's kind of like suicide. People don't talk about it. I have one more question. Um, how do you combine blockchain and human rights? tell you a lot of this. I had three projects. Uh, one of them for Black Lives Matter. I've used blockchain for stuff in the US. Impossible, that's right. I've used blockchain against rape and sexual accusations and for refugees. It's, I'm going to go two ways. The first one is I'm not, I'm going to break some people's heart and I don't feel like they are fair because Valentine's Day. But don't go into human rights. That's the only thing that I have to say. Uh, don't go into anything that involves the word storytelling, gender, immigration, race, friendship, and puppies. Don't go. Don't go. Many people end up seriously broke for their entire lives and they can never recover after going into whatever human rights organization that you go into. I learned it in a very hard hard way. If you're, again, I was 26 and 27, my parents support, I was a journalist in Chicago, quite enough money and savings, you know, whatever the hell you want to, but don't go into human rights, don't go into social corporate responsibility, don't go into anything that is involving refugees. I would argue that the exact same people that deliver products and services they do it for a for-profit, capitalistic basis and help more human rights organizations themselves. The people who work creating the scammers and the phone, they have done more for police accountability against police crimes in the United States than all Black Lives Matter organizations together. Um, whomever created a USB has helped more environment and green logging than Greenpeace and all of their activists together. The human rights organization is all the, the ecosystem is almost the nemesis of technology and entrepreneurship and innovation adaption. You have the slightest idea how useless these people are at trying to explain them the most simple and brutally easy to understand concept of how can they make more money through technology. You can virtually throw them to the trash. You have no idea how ignorant, how incapable of understanding basic concepts of economics or technology are. They're incredible whenever you have to work with them. I went to Calais, to the north of France, to try to help the refugees. And I went with, um, I'm not gonna name them, but they're the biggest organizations out there. And I said, I believe that we can create one thing that is called a DAO, the Centralized Autonomous Organization. I didn't explain them what was the technical part of it, I just told them what would be the solution what was things before, and how things are gonna change later. What is the difference? What are the benefits? How much does it cost? Where do you find them? Where do we start? Very simple, spoon-feed ideas. We have no idea how bad in understanding technology and economics are people in human rights organizations. Don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. Oh, I'm finished. Okay, thank you. <laughs>